Welcome to Season 2, Episode 5, Chronicles of UK Salafism, and Insider Perspective. This episode shall focus on the year 2004 and the events that transpired therein. However, before doing so, I want to make a minor clarification regarding the Muslim Council of Britain contact that rang after the events of Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, came to light. The message was actually, actually from its member Yusuf Baylock, who referred to Inyat Bangawala as the spokesperson and insisted that we should be going through them and nobody else or not speaking on our own behalf. I also want to touch upon the climate that we were continuing to confront. And when looking through some of the archives that I decided not to go into too much detail about, I want to refer to a particular um, website or forum, Islamic Awakening, which was presided over and run by an individual called Abu Zubair from originally from Tutin. And the reason I'm making this reference now is because I'm not going to shy away from highlighting personalities and individuals that we were engaged with or we were confronting or who were confronting us. And the reason I mentioned this um, website or this forum, Islamic Awakening, is because of the rhetoric that was coming out from that in the conversations that were taking place. And I actually went on there and provided a detailed explanation of the events that took place around the Richard Reed shoe bomber affair. And the invigilator and controller was Abu Zubair. I know that and was seeing that things were being edited that I was putting forward, like the website um, of our mosque that highlighted some of the scholars sayings, things like this. However, what was being left unabated were some of the vitriol and attacks against me with individuals um, calling me a Saudi UK agent, spy, enemy of Islam, that um, one day the uh, black flag will come to decapitate me and the like. These things were being left up there. And I'm highlighting this why. I want the listener to get an idea of the extremist rhetoric, the um, very antagonistic re rhetoric that was being dealt with. Now, many know the... Um, composition of the Brixton community and backgrounds and everything. And it's not a community to shy away from these things whatsoever. However, I want to add that the countering of such narratives did not speak with such violence or threats. And I can read out um, some of the excerpts of what I responded to, such that others in that particular forum who were sympathetic to that type of rhetoric actually started defending and asking individuals to calm down, let the man say what he wants, he's got a right to defend himself and, and things like this. And it caused that same individual, not Abu Zubair, as I said, he was the invigilator, but this person who was writing this vitriol, it caused him to even turn on some of those who were telling him to calm down, saying, if you're going to defend him, then I have nothing to do with yourselves either. So that was the rhetoric. And this will lead me into the next big event that took place that was not mentioned in the previous one, because as I mentioned, the most significant event of 2003 globally was the invasion of Iraq, um, which was to set uh, a tide of events that would affect the world after this particular um, US-UK coalition um, and led attack against them. I want to connect that Islamic awakening again, emanating from Tutin to the Azam publications and the declaration of me, ac accusations as well of me not being a Muslim, because in their language, which I didn't highlight in the previous episode, was the, the um, re recommendation, should I say, that now because they had declared me to be a non-Muslim, that I should divorce my wife, I could not be buried in a Muslim um, burial ground and that I would need to retake my Shahada. This was the rhetoric that we were dealing with and had been dealing with since the 90s. And we were and continue to be perfectly capable to counter that narrative, that aggressive, threatening narrative at whatever levels. However, the, the individuals who were issuing these particular narratives 
continually declined to have meetings, um, continually declined to um, bring evidence on what they were saying, relying upon the self-same media that they said couldn't be trusted. And this showed the contradictions in their narratives. You've heard me refer to the leaders of these um, entities from extremism, um, the Abu Qatadas, the Abdullah El Faisals. But I, I've brought it down a notch to those who were, let's say, second or third tier and the activities they were um, doing. As I mentioned, um, with Azam being run by um, Baba Ahmed and his brother and with the affiliates, Moaz and Beg. And they're likely to hear these um, um, podcasts if they've got time to, and they're welcome to come back um, to counter these uh, narratives. However, I've got the documentation here with their words, with what was posted by them. And I'd like to hear from them. I, I did meet one or two of them um, in, in the years by, and um, the conversations were very, very vague conversations. We were not in um, an environment where we could fully engage. I did write to one of the organisations for which one of them now works, um, CAGE, regarding an allegation that they had taken up from one of their so-called clients and the lies that had emanated from that particular individual. And also, I'm, I'm st sticking on this point because detail is important. So, for example, an individual who had been arrested and Cage, for example, represented him. And I'm mentioning this, why it's bringing it across from that time up until now. Um, the individual made lines that I had um, given evidence to the police against him and everything like that. None of that was ever produced because this is something I've never, ever done, as you will hear in the future podcast in which I've represented defendants and never the prosecution. And it came to light that the individual who had actually given evidence against him in one of these cases, because this individual came to me, was a member of his family. It wasn't a distant in-law who had married into the family. And he told me, directly standing across the road from the mosque, I, I spoke to him about the accusations of his in-law, Kenya Muhammad was the individual's name, and that he, these slanders needed to be addressed, that I'd written to Cage and wanted a response from them after giving them the evidence that this has never taken place by me. And this individual, this in-law, who married one of the cousins of this Kenya Muhammad, admitted it was him under pressure, it was he under pressure, who had spoken to the police about his in-law and that he knew that, but he did not retract his slanderous account because it suited his purpose and his negativity and acrimony against the Brixton community and myself. Anyway, continuing to the more significant matter around this extreme ideology and the parameters within which they operate, in January, of 2003, and you'll see why all what I've said up until this point in this episode leads to this. On the 30th of January, Richard Reed, infamously known as the Shoe Bomber, was sentenced to life imprisonment in the US. And the charges that he um, was found guilty of, I'll read them very briefly. One, the attempted use of a weapon of mass destruction. Two, attempted homicide of US nationals overseas. Three, placing an explosive device on an aircraft. Four, attempted murder of passengers on an aircraft. Five, two counts of interfering with a flight crew. Six, willfully attempting to set fire to and destroy aircraft. Seven, using a destructive device during a crime of violence. Eight, attempted wrecking of a mass transportation vehicle which compromises of the new offence created under the new Patriot Act. Now, those were the charges. But joining everything I've said concerning the rhetoric of the extremists on their website, Azam Publications, um, Islamic Awakening, let's listen to the diehard attitude, for want of a better phrase, of Richard Reed, Abdul Rahim, aka the Shoe Bomber, upon receiving sentencing. And this is his statement, I'm reading it out verbatim. Concerning what the court said, I admit, I admit my actions and I further, I further state that I done them. 
I further admit my allegiance to Osama bin Laden, to Islam and to the religion of Allah. With regards to what you said about killing innocent people, I will say one thing. Your government has killed two million children in Iraq. If you think about something against two million, I don't see no comparison. Your government has sponsored the rape and torture of Muslims in the prisons of Egypt and Turkey and Syria and Jordan with their money and their weapons. I don't know. See what I've done as being equal to rape and to torture or to the deaths of two million children in Iraq. So, for this reason, I think I ought not to apologise for my actions. I am at war with your country. I am at war with them, not for personal reasons, but because they have murdered more than so many children. And they have oppressed my religion and they have oppressed people for no reason except that they say we believe in Allah. This is the only reason that America sponsors Egypt. It's the only reason they sponsor Turkey. It's the only reason they back Israel. As far as the sentence, as far as the sentence is concerned, it's in your hand. Only really, it's not even in your hand. It's in Allah's hand. I put my trust in Allah totally and I know that he will give victory to his religion and he will give victory to those who believe and he will destroy those who wish to oppress the people because they believe in Allah. So you can judge and I leave you to judge and I don't mind. This is all I have to say and I bear witness to Muhammad. This is Allah's message. Close quote. Again, the context should become clear to the listener now of the second, third, fourth, fifth, the various tiers of extremist ideology, rhetoric and adherence to the propaganda that they have been nurtured upon. And when listening to uh, Abdul Rahim, Richard Reid, there are many flaws in aspects of his statement, but that's not what will jump out from those who support him. They will jump. What will jump out for them is he's bravely and saying the things that I am at war with your country. He said that in front of the big um, tagout as they see in front of the judge and everything like this and trying to bring noble and legitimate grievances of the Muslim world and to infuse that with the extremist rhetoric belief and justification justification for his attempted terroristic actions. So hopefully the reader will see the parallels between the Islamic Awakening um, Forum, the statements that emanated from Azam Publications website with their pronounced pronunciation of takfir. And this is something that continues up until today. But moving now to 2004, which connects in an interesting way later on in this particular episode. Um, with regards to events that transpired during that year. But I want to move aside from that to look at some local events now, because I think it's necessary to highlight what was taking place um, on a micro level within the community. And one of the achievements, I think, at a local level at that particular time was um, Ikra Independent School getting to the final stages regarding um, voluntary aided status. Um, and achieving um, some government funding. And on the 13th of December, I will jump to the end of the year before coming back um, to earlier in that, that, that particular period. The 13th of December 2004, the Department for Education and Skills, from where I had taken a career break, wrote to the acting head teacher to confirm completion of Ofsted and London Fire Brigade inspections. Remember, Ikra Independent School was the first Muslim school in Lambeth established in 1994, if you refer to season one and one of the local micro events that took place on a community basis was the establishment of Ikra Independent School in the Brixton community right next door to the mosque on that occasion. So in 2004, strategically, operationally and administratively, Brixton Mosque as a convert Salafi led organisation and community continued to progress. However, unfortunately, unfortunately, like many other Salafi communities across the um, country, fledgling, growing, they were being continually distracted and having to counter the de divisive tactics of this continuing vociferous organisation and cult Salafi publications. And the reason I mention that is it's 
it became like a proverbial thorn in the side of these communities who were engaging, who were growing, who were establishing um, particular um, educational elements, study circles uh, in their, their various communities. But because of this hegemonic drive of Salafi publications, that if others did not join with them, they would ensure that they would disparage and cast aspersions on these entities with the scholars who they were drawing close to in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, it meant that many of us had to be paying attention to this. Now, Brixton Mosque was more established than Salafi publications. Um, remember, they emerged later on. Brixton Mosque was a community, community mosque, a community center. It wasn't a partisan group. We had different kinds come in there um, who knew that it was a Salafi run entity, institution, establishment. Unlike Salafi publications who only had a bookshop initially, then they rented um, Wright Street from a Sikh individual and I think they continue to rent until this day unless they've purchased it. I mentioned Sikh individual for a reason not to disparage the landlord, but the fact that these activities and their fundraising for somewhat personal gain, as some of the records later revealed, um, detracted from the charitable focus of raising finances for a place of worship in order that the community Salafi and non-Salafi were free to come and worship there. And there's another issue with this place of worship, as they call it, because one of the senior scholars, none other than Sheikh Wasila Abbas, spoke concerning that mosque because they split away initially from uh, Green Lane Mosque to set up their own mosques. And this is one of the traits of the cult and these individuals splitting away from other centres um, and splitting the community and then disparaging the community from where they had left. Those who listened to uh, the first series, uh, first season of podcast, will remember that when I was elected, this was a call of some of my own colleagues, let's leave this place, when they realised that they were no longer wanted in administration, in, in preference for myself to take the helm, they said, let's leave this place and set up elsewhere. And that is a trait that continues with these individuals up until now. But continuing, so on the 16th of June 2004, one of the mosque members wrote an email to a fellow um, colleague, um, Abdul Haq uh, Ade Ashanti, wrote to Abdurrahman Anderson, a member and trustee, who was travelling to uh, Saudi Arabia for Umrah and then to meet scholars alongside myself. So he wrote an email to Abdurrahman, and I'm going to read this to highlight the distraction of this entity to basically cause us to have to go out to speak to the scholars and complain about them. So the email here was to, to Abdurrahman. Go ahead with it, the points that need to be raised. And the title, sorry, was Important Questions to Sheikh Rabir, dated 16th of June 2004. The email was sent at 8.45 in the morning. And the quest, first question, there is a centre in the UK called al Atharia. This is an a offshoot of Salafi Publications cult in East London, who have said that they are not going to change their name even after Sheikh Rabia's advice. Is the name al Atharia a suitable name when they are not scholars or students of knowledge? Also, none of the Salaf did this, and we don't mind finding uh, the scholars doing this. And we don't find the scholars doing this. Spubs, Salafi Publications, and Troid, the Canadian um, counterpart of this cult, were the ones that made Fale al Harubi from the Kibar Ulama. This was a junior scholar and teacher at the University of Medina, and they had elevated his state status as they had done a number of times with others because it suited their cause and purpose as this particular scholar would speak in a language and with rhetoric that endorsed and suited them. So th that's me adding um, to that. So basically it's saying Spubs and Troy were the ones that made Farla al-Harbi from the Kibar ulama. Continuing the quote, is Farla from the Kibar or should we free ourselves from him and stick to the major scholars and their well-known students? Spubs even set up a website for Farleh next to Sheikh Rabia's. Point three, Amjad Rafiq and Maz Qureshi, the latter from the States, 
secret plan against the Jordanian students of Sheikh al-Albani, describing that they are, quote, unquote, fighting them. Are Amjad Rafiq and Maz Qureshi students of knowledge? Should we take from these two individuals? Question four. On Salafi Talk website, Abu Khadija claimed that the Salafis of the UK are united when they are not. Abu Khadija has set himself up as, as the spokesperson or spokesman for the Salafis of the UK, and he is not qualified to do so. Abu Khadija speaks against the Salafis of Brixton, Leicester, Luton, Bradford, East London, West London, Middlesbrough, Alum Rock, Small Heath, Birmingham and the Ahl Hadith Salafis. Spubs and Troyd have gulu, excessiveness, for al anjuri that's Sheikh al anjuri of Kuwait. And the next point was, is he a sheikh? Six. The following have criticised Abu Khadija and his hizb, his group, for their extremism. Sheikhs Abdus Salam Burgis, Rahimahullah, the students of Sheikh al-Albani, Sheikh Ali Hassan, Sheikh Salim, Sheikh Hussein, Sheikh Musa, Mohammed Musa Nasser. The Kuwaitis, Sheikh Salim al-Tawil, Sheikh Salim al-Tawil, Abu Anas, Hamad Uthman and Fala Saidi. Sheikh Salim al-Tawil described Abu Khadija as being a jahil who people should not sit with. Fala Saidi criticised Fala al-Harbi, so they did not promote his lectures. So basically, um, coming out of the quote, that because this particular sheikh, Fa Fala, uh, Fala Saidi, criticised their sheikh at the time, Fala al-Harbi, Salafi publications did not promote his lectures. Continuing with the quote, due to their hizbiyah to Fale al-Harbi, that is. Continuing, should the Salafis have hizbiyah to Fale al-Harbi or free themselves from him and warn against his excessiveness, his gulu? Other set of scholars who warned against um, Abu Khadija. Finally, the Indian subcontinent, students of Badiadeen Shah, a Sindhi, being Sheikh Zubair Ali, Wasiala Abbas, Sheikh Sana'ullah, Zahid, etc. And the final point of this email with the questions to go to Sheikh Rabir, should the Salafis warn against extremism and tashaddud, tashaddud, sorry, that, was, that has emerged on the Manhaj and refute the gulat, the gulat being the excessive individuals, Salafi publications. And to coincide with that, I hadn't seen that email until my colleague had um, arrived in Saudi and we put a schedule to go and meet the scholars but I'm going to continue and again I want to emphasize to the listener the fact that we needed to deal with this and address this irritant as it were in spite of the climate that we were living in as Muslims in spite of the attention we were paying to countering the extremists and putting more active programs for the youth who may have been susceptible, um, vulnerable to violent extremism and having to put out a public narrative um, and widen our engagement because the authorities were looking on us increasingly as, um, as to whether we were part of the problem. So I wrote down these points on the 22nd of June, 2004. The first point being, and I'll note the title, points to note concerning the history and developments regarding the dawah in the UK, the propagation in the UK. Now, this is not to be mistaken for the previous 14-point historical dawah document for Brixton that I wrote and prepared in 2003. This was 2003. This was separate. So, for example, point one. The Salafis left Jamia Ihyad Min Hajj's Sunnah, excuse me, Jimas, when we learned about its partisanship, its Hezbiyah. Its leader, Abu Muntazir, said that all matters of dawah and contacting the ulama must go through the Jamia first. No one was allowed to contact the ulama themselves, it had to be with Abu Muntazir's knowledge. And uh, Abu, Muntazir is, Abu Muntazir is no longer on this particular um, methodology. Um, we've communicated many times since then, but I'm highlighting this because it's a historical document and I don't want to edit any aspect of it. I'll skip to point three. Then came Jamia Ihyad Tarath al-Islami and its ambassador was Abdullah as -Sabt. He came and promised Salafis with Abu Muntazir um, opportunities to study in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. He also stated specifically to me that he wanted all the Salafis in the UK to unite under Ihya Tarath. This meant leaving Abu Muntazir and Jimas. Abdullah Asapt, just like Abu Muntazir, was also interested in bringing Masjid Ibn Taymiyyah, Brixton, under Ihya Tarath. I clearly explained to him, as I did to Abu Muntazir, 
that the mosque was independent of any jamia or organization. Then the next point, the partisanship of these two organizations became clear to us, especially in them wanting to control the dawah, the propagation in the UK. Today, excuse me. Today, the same thing is happening amongst the Salafis, and it is, I believe, the hidden partisanship, the hidden Hizbiya that we were warned about over five years ago. The next point. There are Salafis who claim authority, using our beloved Sheikh Rabi's name for being responsible, the responsible party in the UK. They claim to be the true representatives of Sheikh Rabi and also the leaders in the West who are capable of doing jahwat ta'deel. In fact, they also give fatwa regarding matters for which they have no authority, such as divorce without direct reference to the people of knowledge. And evidence has been produced um, of that. Uh, you'd have to refer to my Culture's Tendencies series in which I go into the specifics because that's where I, I address the ills, the wrongs, the deviation or, and the mischief of this cult. The next point I mention here is quite a crucial one. The Isnad can be given, the chain of narration can be given regarding Abu Khadija and Spub's plans and statements to make sure that all Salafis, quote, come through them, close quote, regarding the dawah in the UK, stroke the West. Deceitful means have been used to set up SalafiTalk.net, another affiliate um, entity of theirs, and show that they, Abu Khadija and co, are not actually behind administering the site. There are two chains of narrations that verify they set up and supported this site in order to perform jah, criticism, disparagement, more clearly against other people without it being known that they were directly involved. This would protect themselves and their main website if anything went wrong. Even after Sheikh Rabi's recent advice to the Salafis in the UK, they, the cult, the Salafi Publications cult, stated that the Sheikh's address was to other Salafi groups and not theirs. And this is a key point that I raised, the following is a key point I raised when I visited Sheikh Al-Banna, and their now um, cult affiliate, uh, Dr. Abdelilah Lahmami, when he and I were closer colleagues and we used to engage and evolve um, with each other a lot more, I wrote this point here. It should be known that they have made claims that they never unite upon error when it comes or when it concerns doing a jah upon others. This was placed on their website and highlighted clearly. I took this to Sheikh al -Banna, and Abdelillah Lahmami translated my question to the Sheikh, whose response was that this was misguidance itself and that such claims were for the Sahaba, etc. only. Sheikh Al-Banna also, Al also said that instead we should be humbling ourselves. I am unaware whether Abdelillah took this advice back to the brothers, but what came to me was his warning about me and asking that I, I not know of this warning as he did not want um, it to be known that he'd spoken about me. Okay, now, concluding this point, I mentioned here, in conclusion, the partisanship of Jimas and Ihya Tarath and their wanting to be an authority and lead the dawah is identical to what Spub's Salafi publications are doing now. And the concluding point here I wrote, I only write this to try and give what many Salafis are seeing in the UK, but are nervous about speaking about due to the ability of Salafi publications and their colleagues to cause family and social problems for these individuals by discrediting and then alienating them in a society where the Muslims and especially the Salafis are few in number amongst the non-Muslims. Alienation in such circumstances, therefore, causes severe problems for such individuals and their families, hence their reasons for remaining quiet. End of quote. So these two um, points, these two papers were prepared to present to the scholars at the time. We will draw to a conclusion in this section of the podcast, this particular episode, by listing some significant international events that occurred throughout 2004 and the first of those occurred on the 1st of February 2004 
where 251 people were trampled to death and 244 injured during a stampede at Hajj that year. On the 2nd of March, during the war in Iraq, Iraq, Al-Qaeda apparently carried out the Ashura massacre, killing 170 individuals and wounding over 500. And then we saw uh, an event that impacted in the West on a scale similar to 9-11. And that was on the 11th of March when terrorists exploded simultaneous bombs in Madrid's railway network that ripped through a commuter train and rocked, destabilised three stations, killing 190 people. I remember that event clearly because I was um, staying in Mecca for the weekend with my um, family uh, and we were about to perform Umrah a few hours from that time, but we, we were glued to the television and the explosions were actually captured on the CCTV um, on the platform. Um, and they were quite horrific, as one could expect. On the 3rd of September, then came another huge terrorist event in Russia, the Besland School Massacre, which began as a siege, and many were shocked and taken aback by seeing Muslim women, sisters, wearing the Middle Eastern black abaya, which is donned by um, um, Muslims and Orthodox Muslims across the, the Muslim world now, not just the Middle East, but um, wearing black abayas and niqabs, um, holding um, Kalashnikovs and other weapons, bombs. And this siege ended in a massacre, a lot of it to do with the security's heavy-handed and clumsy um, approach to um, breach the security where the um, hostages were being held. And approximately 344 people, mostly teachers and children, died on that occasion. Then we moved to the 29th of October 2004. And the news network Al Jazeera broadcasted an excerpt of a video from Osama bin Laden, where he directly admitted responsibility for the September 11th attacks. If that was not enough in that particular year, I will move on to two more events. And one was on the 8th of November in the war um, in Iraq, where 10,000 US troops and uh, a specific number, a smaller number of Iraqi associate troops um, descended on Fallujah. And those who are unaware of what transpired and the stories that emanated from there should research and look at the brutality of what took place um, and innocent civilians as well who were attacked, brutalised, some rapes took place and then women and children were murdered after these, um, these atrocious attacks by some American troops. But the brutality of what took place in Fallujah has left an um, indelible print in the memories of many Muslims because of the excessiveness that took place on that occasion. And then finally, uh, a more natural disaster that shocked the world as we were viewing the extent of the devastation as it was being caused and after it was being caused. And that was none other than the Boxing Day tsunami, 26th of December, that hit Sri Lanka, India, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, the Maldives and the edges of the Indian Ocean, in which 230,000 individuals were killed. And I'll conclude on that point, 2004, as it re related to events, as the reader may recall, was very traumatic. However, in the next episode, when I discuss 2005, the UK was to witness an escalation and for the first time, homemade terrorism, homegrown terrorism, should I say, um, on a scale that had not been witnessed um, by Muslims before. Um, and that I'm referring to none other than the 7-7 um, attacks and what ensued afterwards.